So let me ask you this. What's the single asset that's common to all projects? People? And just show of hands, what do you know about the people on your projects? Do you have the technical specifications, as it were, for the people on your projects? Do you have the operating instructions? Do you know the environment in which that particular piece of equipment, if you will, is going to perform as reliably and as excellently as you might like? Do you know what its maintenance cycle is? Anybody? Has anybody in their work life experienced a maintenance cycle for people yet? Not so much? So we're going to talk about how to help the people on your projects in your organizations deliver reliable, excellent results over time. And we're going to use happiness, which is really subjective well-being, as the model. Now, one of the things that we're currently working on, and I just want to frame it this way, will include a few uh, data elements from it, is we're working on a project to assess happiness at work for project managers. We call it the Happy PM Project. We're using a survey that was developed in Britain by Nick Marks, working for the New Economics Foundation. And it's a model that essentially was adopted by the British government to look at well-being, happiness, as an adjunct to, a supplement to, looking at gross domestic product. And so we're going to have an analog to that here in saying that it's very important, as Dr. Kersner talked about, to have all those metrics that are traditional, profit, all kinds of KPIs relative to projects. But it's also important on the flip side to measure and sustain the people on the projects in order to get a real picture of project and organizational success and also to be sure that you can deliver over time. Uh, the International Institute for Leadership, IIL, uh, has helped us, as has the Montgomery uh, County PMI chapter, to do some initial data gathering, and I wanted to acknowledge that as well. DC PMI has helped us as well. So let's get started. The first idea I want to introduce is we want to move from thinking about projects and organizations as simply being driven by financial measures. So really a profit-driven piece. Some of that is really coming from a large macroeconomic trend change. But what we want to look at, and these are the three Ps I'm going to offer here, is we want to look at organizations as being successful if they have profitability, and we'll modify that slightly if it's a nonprofit or uh, a government agency to be financially successful or mission successful, that it's about the people being a sustainable and not a depreciable asset, and about purpose, which is fundamental to motivation and why we hopefully come to work in the first place. So let's talk for a second about the macro trends that make that trilogy so very important. Most of us, I think, are beginning to experience, hopefully are beginning to experience, the receding recession. Uh, the boomers, no doubt because of the receding recession, are beginning to retire. Uh, we're not fast at it. Um, we may be partially retired uh, and partially working, but we boomers will begin to retire. The estimate is that 30 to 40 million people net will leave the workplace when the boomers do that. So the competition for highly qualified employees is going to become ever more uh, competitive, and it's complicated because of immigration and other things where people are going to be much more mobile. Changing expectations of work. I was reading an article yesterday that was talking about a 30-year-old who basically was making the decision to work 30 hours a week, integrate, not balance, work life, and was freelancing because they were able, with that structure, to be able to create a life where they had good work-life balance, were able to pursue interests now and not later. It was not on their retirement bucket list and still make a good income relative to what they were doing. So we're going to think about three Ps. Now, people in our projects are our greatest natural resource. We're going to talk about happiness, really, as being part of, comprised of four elements. 
Part of what, what is involved in being happy as an individual is what are your personal resources? How are you doing? Are you healthy? Do you have supportive relationships? Are you doing something that matters to you? Do you have reasonable work-life balance? Are you able to attain the objectives you set out for yourself? Are you satisfied net-net with your life? People with those strong personal resources then come into organizations and interact with those organizations. And the result of that is how motivated are they? In the people track this morning, we had some interesting discussions around motivation. And we'll talk about that a little bit. And then ultimately, we want to talk about the experience of work. Those four things describe happiness at work. Now, let's talk a minute about personal resources. Managers are obligated, in some ways, to take care of or to appear to be taking care of their employees. So Gallup uses the question, for example, my manager cares about me or someone cares about me. And that's, that's a leading indicator for employee engagement, which yields discretionary effort, yields good results and key performance indicators. What we want to be sure of, though, is what are the resources that people have? Some of it's genetic. Some of it's how well do they take care of themselves. Some of them is what environment do the employers create or the project managers create that allow them to enhance and maintain their personal resources. Our personal resources, however, as, as a whole, are really in jeopardy, are really in jeopardy. And while managers, project managers, can't control or manage those, we can do things that enable our people to be not a depreciable asset, but in fact to be a sustainable asset in the projects we work with. The single largest issue in the maintenance of, of good profit outcomes and in the maintenance and development of good personal resources essential to happiness is stress. Now let me just ask you this. If I asked you if net-net, when you think back about the last month or so, how stressed are you? How many of you would say not really stressed at all? That would be a factor of five. How many moderate average stress? How many, that's much better. And how many of you have really experienced extraordinary mind-numbing stress over the last month? I mean, let's be real, okay? So what's our biologically, you know, sort of the installed software response to stress? We're wired, we sort of have, and it's, it's one of the things that, and I'll talk about it a little flippantly, one of the things to understand is that our brains are wired for survival, and our stress response is survival-oriented. So if we perceive a threat, whether it's the, the classic story of the saber-toothed tiger, or a boss on a rampage, or a client whose demands haven't yet been fulfilled, or a cranky employee, or a no-show, or whatever it happens to be, our bodies physiologically respond to all of those in essentially the same way. In essentially the same way. There's a huge release of stress hormones. They get our uh, heart racing. They move blood away from our extremities. They do all kinds of things so that we're very able to make immediate decisions and take action not necessarily the best action, but immediately, immediate action relative to survival. Doesn't matter whether it's the boss or the proverbial saber-toothed tiger. Let me tell you a little bit about how stress affects our personal resources. Uh, the American Psychological Association, which runs a program that you may have seen called the Psychologically Healthy Workplace, reports that 60%, we were doing a little better than that, 60% of people in organizations experience very high levels of stress, so the equivalent of the saber-toothed tiger response every month. The effect net of high levels of stress, unresolved high levels of stress, is about $300 billion a year in lost productivity due to illness, incidental illness, chronic illness, absenteeism, or people who are showing up to work in what I'll call present but not quite accounted for. So bums in the chair but not fully engaged in terms of brain. $300 billion a year. Excess stress, unresolved stress, 
is the single greatest threat to our personal resources and therefore to our happiness and therefore to our results on projects. What happens is that it increases uh, short-term illness. Are you seeing project team members, for example, who suddenly all have colds and flu? That's, a lead that's basically telling you that stress levels have gone high enough that the immune system is depressed, one of the consequences of stress, because biologically you don't need your immune system to worry about a cold if the saber-toothed tiger is going to eat you this afternoon or if the boss is going to have a serious conversation with you. So your body just gives up on that. So if you're seeing lots of sick people, pay attention. It's also a matter of creating tremendous chronic disease. Here's one of the things I found interesting, is 75% of all healthcare costs are preventable with lifestyle changes, 75%. And we're all living in organizations that are making adjustments to benefit plans, trying to figure out how to pay for appropriate health care, et cetera. Now, that's a profit piece, is if we can reduce and manage stress appropriately, and please be clear, I'm not suggesting we don't have stress. We need stress if we want to perform. We just need to manage it, and we need to work with the installed software, if you will, is that what happens is that we, um, we are not able, when we're under too much stress, to do appropriate, healthy behaviors. So get these statistics. If you're under chronic stress, you're 30% less likely to eat well. Anybody besides me realize that they haven't eaten all day at 3 o'clock in the afternoon when they have a wicked headache or get cranky? Uh, they're 25% less likely to exercise. They're two times more likely not to succeed at a weight loss problem, program. And they enjoy 50% less sleep, which is essential to sustained cognitive function, if they're under too much stress. So how do those things affect your project performance when you have people who are coming to work not well nourished, not well exercised, not well rested, with chronic health issues? So I'm going to offer that the first thing we can do to increase happiness at work and increase this triple bottom line of profits, people, and purpose is manage stress. Now, in our Happy Project Manager survey, one of the things that we assessed was the self-reported level of stress of project managers. We had just about 850 people responding to the large survey. And of those 850 people, uh, they were, by the way, it was a global survey predominantly U.S., but with strong representation around the world. The vast majority of project managers reported really seriously low scores, about a 3 out of 10, in terms of enduring really extravagantly high levels of stress. Is that reality for you all? No doubt. But what, we, what I'm going to offer is, while we can't change that reality, we can change totally how we deal with that reality. And if we want to be successful, more successful, basically have sustainable people assets, we need to actively manage stress. And what's interesting here is that it leads to better results. It leads to better outcomes for the humans. And what happens is, it, if it's better for your employees, it actually cascades back into their families, their significant others, and their community. So it has pro-social benefits, not only in terms of your project, your organization, them, their family, but also then their immediate community. So it's something that has tremendous potential benefit. One of the things that we tested for in the survey was we asked people to tell us how many hours were they working in a peak week, in a peak week. How many of you are routinely working 60 hours or more? How many 50 hours or more? Okay. Here's what we found out. When we looked at segregated by number of average out peak hours of work per week as a project manager, what we found was that the break point was at 50 hours a week. And there was a marked difference between people who are working 50 hours and less and people who are working 50 hours and more in terms of how stressed were they and therefore how strong were their personal resources? 
How many of you would say, if I asked it this way, could you do your work in 50 hours a week, would say no? It's just simply not possible to get my real day job done in 50 hours a week. Now, there's an interesting split here because we, most of us said we are working more than 50 hours a week. And at the same time, most of us are saying we could get it done in 50 hours a week. So there's a moment of opportunity here with that. I had a client in Boston, a company called then Design Continuum, and they actually had a very interesting practice. The research is that productivity goes down at the 50-hour mark. And so if you want to be really efficient with your people asset, you don't want them working more than 50 hours a week because while their bums are in the chair, as it were, they're not as productive as they might be. And it increases their stress. It causes issues with their work-life balance. It causes issues with exercise and other uh, healthy behaviors. And so we want to think about that 50 hours a week. That firm was the first one I've seen, and they were extremely successful design firm in all kinds of design areas. Their HR manager actually reviewed time reports and went back and talked to people who were working more than 50 hours a week because they knew that if they wanted creative problem solvers, creative designers, and a healthy workforce, they needed to manage not the upside, but they needed to keep it down in terms of total hours worked. The second thing that's, that's coming about is that telework, alternative work schedules, et cetera, have a huge benefit. And so that's one of the other ways we can alleviate stress. One of the surveys that we've done with people who are self-employed consultants as a very small subset shows that people who are self-employed actually have higher happiness at work and much greater personal resources than anybody who's in a paying job for an employer, by far. And what it's about is that they have the ability to manage their time and behaviors. So not that they avoid stress, but that they're able to manage it. The other thing that we found in looking at what contributes to stress for project managers was commute. How many of you routinely work an hour, routinely commute an hour or more each way, this being Washington? How many of you do more than that? A few? We found that 60, 60 minutes was the break point in terms of personal resources. We did some work with a happiness at work survey for a design firm, a digital uh, advertising company in the 270 corridor. And it was an interesting project around telecommuting and alternative work schedules. It was a privately held firm. And in this privately held firm, it was a man and, a, uh, and his wife. They had very differing opinions about whether you needed line of sight supervision or whether you could trust people to get their work done if you set goals and measured it appropriately. When we did a happiness at work survey for them, we included, as we did in the happy project manager survey, questions about average commute time. And we were able to persuade the gentleman who was opposed to alternative work schedules, telework, flex time, that actually he could enhance the productivity and to his business need, the creativity of people if they weren't playing Russian roulette when they got on 270 to get to this company, that they could actually get to work on a reliable basis. So something as simple as allowing people to flex when they showed up for work, not if they showed up for work, and adding telework actually enhanced their business outcomes by reducing stress. Giving people the autonomy to make choices reduce their stress. And those things have consequences relative to profit, productivity, but also then to what people need to do. So a couple of suggestions relative to personal resources. One of the things we want to do if we want to help people increase their happiness, whether we're doing it for ourselves or for our project team or more generally depending on our role in an organization, is we really want to think about when are we working and why are we working more than 50 hours a week. Make the choices. We want to be able to minimize that commuting time to the greatest extent possible. It's one of the huge contributors to a lack of happiness. It also contributes to poor health. We want to be able to manage that. To the extent you have the autonomy as a project manager to do that, we would encourage you to do that. It will yield reward in terms of project performance. One of my pet peeves, and it runs to this stress thing, is the mantra of do more with less. We've all heard it, right? 
There's a piece of it, I think, where do more with less, if we're talking about do it better, constantly innovate, constantly improve, is entirely appropriate. When we do it and we just simply continue to ratchet up the level of stress people feel either to do their job or to keep their job or to get a promotion is actually a failure of management. It's actually a failure of management. Dr. Kersner talked about it a little bit this morning in terms of making sure that any projects that are approved are strategically aligned. At some point, I would argue that they become not strategically aligned if you don't have sufficient resources to do them in a way that does not make your people a depreciable asset. They're not a car, they're not a tractor, they're not a big front end loader, they're your most valuable and complex asset. So we want to be sure that we manage them accordingly. The other thing that's interesting from the research is that how you view stress, something as simple as what is your individual, what is your team dynamic relative to thinking about stress, changes the impact of stress itself. So how you think matters. And that's the one thing in all of this we individually can control. What the research showed was that people who view stress as a challenge have less deleterious effects of stress in the workplace and they're better able to cope with it than people who see it as a threat. So if it dials you up in a positive, I can do it way, it actually reduces the stress. Now I want to offer one last point here. There's a researcher, uh, it's Blair and Schwartz, they wrote a book probably about six or seven years ago called The Power of Full Engagement. I highly recommend it. Here's the seminal point from that relative to stress. Stress is inevitable. If we don't have stress, we will get nothing done. I would go a little bit further and say if we don't have stress, we're probably no longer breathing. It's a fact of life. We are hardwired to be able to deal with extraordinary stress to survive. What we are not organized to do or what we are not uh, capable of doing is living in the red zone of high stress all the time. And so what Lair and Schwartz offer is this analogy. And it's very important. Think about how you might apply this on, for yourself and for your project teams. Is think about if you were going to be training as an Olympic weightlifter. Would you get up at 6 in the office, in the gym at 7, uh, lift until you got so hungry you couldn't lift anymore, then go grab some caffeinated drinks, some candy, some chips, Go back to work, lift until you couldn't do it. Does that sound like a plan for becoming a world-class athlete? Not so much? Does that mirror in any way the work life that we enjoy when we're under tremendous stress? Am I alone in that? Okay. So here's what Lair and Schwartz say, is when you have periods of extravagant stress, that's good, what you need, just as the Olympic weightlifter would have in training, is you need good nutrition, you need good exercise, you need social support, you need a good coach, and most importantly, you need a period of rest and recovery. And so if you're under extravagant stress, if you can take a break, let your team take a break, not go from one crisis to another without a break. This isn't like weeks of vacation. This could be an afternoon off. This could go be going out to the ball game. It can be small things, but think about yourself as a world-class athlete in training and sustaining performance. Stress is great, but we want to be sure that we can manage it. And our software, as installed at the factory, requires we get a rest between major events of stress. So that's personal resources. Now, we had an interesting discussion a little bit in terms of the uh, people track this morning around money and motivation. And I'll mention it here for the good of the overall audience. Uh, we won't be able to go all the way into it, and I'm sure there will be lots of variations on opinions. Basically, money matters, but only to a certain extent. Money matters in terms of motivation and happiness only to a certain extent. There's some theorists who suggest that there's a base level, and it depends on your community, 
of what level of income you need, what level of monetary remuneration you need to be happy, be satisfied, and therefore be productive at work. Um, in the US, it, it ranges, depending on the research and when it was done, somewhere between 45 and probably $65,000 a year um, to meet basic needs, to sort of take it off the table. Interestingly, the Forbes list of the happiest companies in the US, the average salary for all but one of those 25 is $65,000 a year or more. So it's kind of an interesting experiential piece to that. Uh, money does matter. If you're interested in how money matters and how it motivates, I recommend a video of Dan Pink. Dan Pink wrote the book, for those of you who don't know, a book about, about motivation called Drive. Very, very popular. There's a video, for those of you who don't have time um, to read, that I think is really outstanding, that really talks about what are the keys to motivation. Money's part of it certainly not all of it. And as project managers, we really want to understand, specifically given the economic constraints we all live under, what motivates besides money? What motivates besides money? So I recommend that video to you. Now, motivation, let me make sure that's the slide we're going to. The environment that we work in basically our organization, has a huge impact once we walk in the door with our personal resources in some semblance of order in terms of how we're, how we're going to do. I do a fair amount of work working with organizations who have not managed their infrastructure organizations and their people part of the management of their organizations well. And if I had a bottom line conclusion, it would be I would love for people to implement what we know works. Because if we did, I could retire, and so could everybody who does OD consulting. We've not yet been able to do that, but one of the reasons I really enjoy speaking with project management audiences is project managers, if persuaded, will execute. So I kind of see you all as the first line of defense or perhaps offense relative to getting organizations to put into practice what we know works relative to creating good workplaces. Here's what we found out about how project managers in our survey view their organizational systems. Not surprisingly, the vast majority of people had poor results relative to job security. The second worst score for project managers relative to contributing to their overall being and therefore performance at work was that they have unattainable, unachievable jobs. This one surprised me is the next thing kind of coming up from the bottom was that project managers don't get constructive feedback. Don't get constructive feedback. All of those, those three things are essential. So job security, given the realities of life, what we want to do if we're in fact working in an organization where certainty is not possible, does that apply, not apply to anybody? It's all uncertain over time is what we want to do is we want to be as transparent as possible and we want to help people prepare for when that contract changes or shifts over. We want to give people the line of sight to what could happen and the skills to deal with what happened. And they can do that if they have the personal resources unfettered by too much stress. Achievability of job, actually, if, it's, if the jobs are perceived as being way out of reach, there's a point of diminishing return relative to motivation. At some point, if you think it's just simply not possible in this lifetime or the next one to accomplish something, then you become less likely to actually perform. So the manager's role in creating happiness as a competitive advantage is to be able to get that dynamic balance where it's out of reach but close enough that it's perceived as possible, but not so far gone that it's not perceived as possible at all. And as I mentioned earlier, the continuing mantra of do more with less and putting the pressure on the staff, not on management and not on leadership, to properly resource things makes that unachievability a reality for way too many people. When I was CFO at AERP, one of the things that was fascinating is we never, and I suspect this is true in many organizations, it was very difficult to sunset to retire any project, any project. 
And so even though there were constraints on resources, constraints on money, constraints on time, constraints, frankly, on the member's interest, nothing was ever retired. Or as Dr. Kersner talked about, projects were done whether they were of strategic importance or not. And so one of the things ahead of us is for as managers and as leaders is to be willing to, to call it as we see it about what we can actually do as stretch players, but not so far that we diminish our ability to perform sustainably in the long run. This becomes really important for this reason, is as we lose people in the workplace, as the boomers retire and we realize a 30 million person net deficit, people will have choices about where they work. And they will make those choices. And so one of the reasons why being a good workplace, by creating a happy project management oriented workplace, is it's going to be strategically important to retain the people that you have that, you, that are appropriate to your your mission being delivered. Losing them could be pretty significant. APA suggests that uh, if you have a, a, a non-technical person, it costs 8 to 20 percent of their salary to replace them. Technical people, it's 20 percent to 400 percent simply to replace the person exclusive of their implicit knowledge, all the networking that they had, all, the, all their capability. And so losing people is an expensive proposition. And as we get more and more competitive for people, it's going to be a longer cycle with significantly greater costs. So we really want to create an environment that people want to be in, and happiness at work is one of the ways to do that. Now, one of the things I do want to mention here on the plus side is project managers in our survey were pretty happy about their pay. Pretty happy about their pay. So the good news was people were getting paid appropriately, but were in crazy stress. And the other thing that was a positive was they were seldom bored. Seldom bored. All very useful. Now, I want to talk a little bit about employee engagement. How many of you are familiar with employee engagement? Most? Okay, here's the thumbnail. Employee engagement, Gallup is probably the best known purveyor of employee engagement. Um, they measure it with 12 questions. Um, the one that's the leading indicator for employee engagement is I have a best friend at work. Um, they don't mean a social best friend, they mean a mentor, a coach, someone who would challenge you, someone who networks for you, etc. The point that's important here is that employee engagement is a proxy for internal motivation. Internal motivation. So motivation at an individual level, not driven by external rewards. Not by a paycheck, not by a bonus, not by a premium parking space, et cetera. From a project management standpoint, if we want to create a great workplace and if we want to create sustainable good results, we want to be sure that we create an environment, and the language is really important here, managers create an environment in which people can be motivated. That's important is to create the environment as opposed to motivate, because motivate's really about a carrot and stick. I can motivate you with if-then kind of or contingent rewards. Those work so long as I have the reward and can continue to give it to you that I am attentive to the if-then conversation, and that that reward actually matters to you and you don't get accustomed to it and decide, well, that bonus last year was great, but this, you know, giving me the same bonus this year just doesn't do it for me. Because we habituate to positive experiences. So we want to be able to think about four things, which is what engagement is about. And this is where we get real lift in terms of profit and organizational performance, and it's where we get the dedication of the people on our projects. And here's what those levers are. People are interested in autonomy. People are interested in being able to have some flexibility, whether it's schedule, whether it's how they go about doing the job, or even in some cases what job they do. One of the things we can do as managers to create happiness and good long-term results is to, is to create autonomy. Now, we had a discussion this morning about, you know, there's some places where autonomy is just not appropriate. 
The research basically says that if you want to have people remain motivated, explaining why there's not autonomy is appropriate. I need you to do this because we're a nuclear regular regulate, we're a nuclear plant and we're heavily regulated and there's a high safety risk, and you need to do it exactly this way. Getting the constraint on autonomy with an explanation actually preserves autonomy. And the other possibility is that you give alternatives. So you may have boundaries in which people can make decisions. That's OK if people can participate in generating alternatives and executing them. It preserves this intrinsic motivation. So autonomy is one. The next thing is we basically are hive animals. Relatedness is incredibly important. How many of you who are Maryland grads here have something on your person that has a UMD logo on it? A few. How many of you at work have shirts, caps, lanyards, something that identifies you as belonging to a particular group? How many of you have some paraphernalia that, that identifies the sports team you're just totally enthralled with? Okay. How many of you, when you meet people, talk about where you're from? And if you meet people who are from someplace proximate to your hometown, even if it's just the same state or in an international meeting, the same continent, feel connected. And that if they needed something, you might help them out. Yeah? That's what I'm talking about by relatedness. As project managers, one of the big impediments to motivation, and it's true particularly in virtual teams, but also in face-to-face -face teams where the people, the players rotate a lot, where, ta where teams are not retained intact, that lack of relatedness diminishes people's uh, behaviors for the benefit of the group, like safety, and it diminishes their motivation. So if I, as a person from Pennsylvania, know that there's somebody in the room that is, is here at this symposium from Pennsylvania, and they come to me and say, can you help me? That simple shared relationship of being from Pennsylvania, even though I've never met them, not likely to meet them again, will motivate me. That's just how we're wired. We're hive animals. So when you think about creating a great workplace and getting great performance in a sustainable way, are you creating an environment where people can have best friends and where they have that, those clear relatedness pieces? Or are they just interchangeable pieces of a piece of machinery that come and go that works? It's not nearly as effective as having a strong sense of group identity and relatedness. Now the other thing, and there are times when I was managing people um, earlier in my career where I wouldn't have said this was true. Um, people do not come to work with the intention of being poor performers. They don't. The fact is they do sometimes poorly perform and that that's an issue that we have to deal with. But people are driven by a desire to get better at what they do every day. And we see that behavior even in things that are voluntary. So something like Wikipedia where people are doing work for nothing but are doing really major activities, they're doing it because they get better at it each time. So setting a possibility for people to do work that advances their mastery is a way to motivate. So do you have your best people doing things that are just way too easy for them? Because it reduces your project risk, reduces your risk of delivery, so it's reasonable, but does it create a sustainable strategy? Or do we want to have some mix? We want to have some mix in terms of how hard is the work to do, how different is the work to do. Gallup uses the language, do I have the opportunity to learn and grow every day? The opportunity to do something new and different every day, to learn something new or get better at what you know how to do, is a critical element of motivation. The one you don't pay for. The one that you can do by how you interact with people. And the last thing is purpose. Does the work you do matter? One of the things we're seeing with the generational shift is increasingly people are saying, you know, it's great that I have a good job and I have uh, lots of promotional opportunity. But increasingly, and this is certainly not for all people in this age group, but for an emerging group of them, they have the opportunity to work because the work is interesting to them 
and because it met, they're doing it in service of a cause that is of value to them. And so we want to be sure that we look at what's the purpose. One of the things that we found in our survey was that the opportunity is being missed to have what some writers would call a strategic narrative around the purpose of the organization. Why are people doing these projects? Both in terms of customer and stakeholder benefits, but also in terms of societal benefits. One of the things we know for sure is that when people are doing something that has purpose, and it can really be three things. It can be, does it help me? You know, am I learning and growing? Is it good for my customers and clients, my stakeholders? And is it good for society in general? That motivates. And that creates this happiness at work. So when you think about the projects that you're currently running, could your people talk about what the, what the purpose is? Is there a purpose that could be a rallying point? Is the purpose something that's congruent with the values of the people on your team? And are you talking about it? Are you talking about it? One of the clients that I worked with in California, uh, again, a digital advertising company, had an interesting conversation about purpose. Because they were doing things, they were doing advertisements for movies, new movies, they were doing advertisements for fancy, very fancy cars. Um, and they couldn't see purpose in that. And it was one of the places where they really struggled because what their purpose really was, for the most part, was driven by mastery. Motivation in that organization was more mastery than purpose driven because these were highly technical, creative people and they were driven by being able to do the next cool thing from a de design and technology standpoint. Laura Bernard's going to talk about the uh, day of service that the PMI DC chapter did, which is a great example of purpose as motivation. And I'm going to give her a plug here because it well deserves it. The day of service, how many of you were there? Anybody? Just a few. This is, if you get, if you get an opportunity, hear Laura. But what, what the day of service was was this, because it's all about purpose, is the structure was that there were a number of nonprofits and a number of project managers who donated their time to meet with these project, these uh, nonprofits, small nonprofits who have lots and lots of needs, to develop project plans for a project of strategic importance. It was volunteer. Motivation in that, and the energy around motivation in that experience was amazing to observe. And it was interesting because it wasn't just the people who were receiving the benefit. It was the people who were giving the benefit. They were really charged up because they were able to give, this was the purpose, something of incredible value to organizations that were doing pro-social activities, whether it was helping kids get through high school or dealing with abused women and children or, whatever, or providing educational programs. The range of charitable uh, organizations was extraordinary, but purpose drives activity. Why am I doing it? It's really important. And there'll be a small fee for that plug. <laughs> now, I want to mention one thing further, because, and Dr. Kersner talked about it a little bit this morning as well, is when I, when I was growing up in, in the profession, and I grew up as in public accounting and finance, um, not dissimilar in many respects from the technical tracks that you all have come from and the kinds of work you do. Pretty intense, stress-oriented. You needed to be able to sort of man up into the stress that you were dealing with. We were taught and expected that emotions needed to be left at the door. And here's what I want to leave you with, is emotions are a supplemental intelligence system. They're a supplemental intelligence system. If you're angry, you need to pay attention to that. You need to manage it appropriately, but you need to pay attention to it. If you're nervous, anxious, happy, joyful, excited, grateful, whatever it happens to be, those are data points that you need to be able to act upon in project management with your staff. Now, one of the things that we generally don't do, and I think it's true for all of us in technical fields, is we don't spend a whole lot of time thinking about that 
or thinking about emotional intelligence. <coughs> Excuse me. What we do know is that your net emotional experience, and net's an important word not just because I'm a finance geek at heart, is net is important. It is absolutely imperative that you do experience negative emotions. It's part of human nature, part of the human experience to be disgusted, ashamed, angry, frustrated, all good. What's not good is if those are the only emotions that you experience, because the research is that those emotions, while survival-oriented, shut down your ability to think creatively and generate alternatives. Barbara Fredrickson, who's at the University of North Carolina, basically provides research that offers this, is that you want to be sure, for good performance, that you have a minimum of three experienced positive emotions to one negative emotion. Now, I'm not thinking that at each meeting you sort of tote it up and say, okay, I'm short too, help me out here. There are times when the meeting's going to be a negative emotion-laden meeting, and that's, that's it, that's okay. But net-net, you want to be sure that you get that net positive. What she found is that organizations deliver better results more sustainably if it's about six to one. There were two other key ratios around human interaction that she found in her research. One is there's a balance between a focus on me and everybody else. Almost one to one. So if you want to have a really high performance team, you need to be as concerned about, the pe about yourself, the people on your team, your team, and the people on all those other teams that make up the organization. And last but not least, the other key ratio, again about one to one, is between inquiry, seeking to understand, and advocacy, making your point. So when you think about your next staff meeting, and you're walking away from it and just not feeling all that chipper about it, think about those three ratios. How much positive and negative emotion was experienced? Was it inquiry oriented or was it advocacy oriented? What was the balance? Were we focused on our own parochial interests or were we focused more broadly on the interests of everybody that's involved in the project? Because those things will help create competitive advantage by creating much higher performance for the teams. So I'm getting, I think, the high sign here. Is that true, John? John? We're good on time? Perfect. Um, so questions and comments. We're going to offer uh, an opportunity for some uh, to take either a team assessment, which we're doing for project managers, or individual assessments about happiness at work, should you be interested in doing that. But I'm ha happy to answer any questions, should there be some. Is that any gender difference? Um, a little, it depends on the, we've had a couple of different samples and we have seen some gender differences. And I use the same survey in my class at, here at, at Maryland. Um, it's more pronounced in the class at Maryland than it was in the larger survey, which could be an artifact of the sample size, I think. Um, sometimes we see that the relationship piece for women, because they're in the minority in some of these technical fields, they don't have the same dimension, the same depth of relationships that they might have, uh, and the men therefore have higher happiness at work. We did not see that so much in the much larger survey. Thank you. Yes? Oh, sorry, on the positive and negative emotions and the ratio of that, were there particular emotions that played into that on each side of that equation? Um, the question was, were, were there particular emotions that play into it? Um, all emotions will play into it, and so there's some primary ones. Um, in the positive side, it's things like awe, joy, Gratitude. Gratitude, by the way, is an underused emotion in the workplace. If you, if you could do nothing but recognize people by being grateful for what they've done today, you could go long on, on results. Um, the negative emotions tend to be anger, frustration, um, sometimes disgust in terms of just, you know, I'm, it comes across in terms of I've kind of done with you, which are primary emotions, fed up. But basically, all of the emotions, negative, positive, or negative, influence that. And some of that has to do not only with how we experience it, where it's going straight to the emotional registry of our brain, and some of it is how we think about it. And so we have some choices there. 
Anything else? Yes, ma'am. I need you to use a big voice, but I'll repeat you. Uh, the generational differences, because you're going to have your manager in one generation, typically have the employees in a different generation or you know different focus. Do you ha find that the yeah. managers have trouble translating the motivations between what they would want versus what their employees might want? I think there are a couple things. The question is, are there generational differences? We did see some age-related differences. Too soon to tell exactly what to make of them. We did see some age-related differences uh, where people are happier at work when they first start. Uh, middle managers are, broadly speaking, the least happy. They're sort of the sandwich generation in the family at the, work, at the workplace. Um, and very senior executives tend to be happiest at work. So there's, there's some that tracks both age and rank, if, if you will. Um, the other thing that I think we're going to find, and we don't have the data to support it yet, but I would expect it to go this way from other things that we're reading, is that people in the younger generations are going to be much more interested in purpose and mastery and sort of self actualization kinds of things than people in my generation where you know when I started working in public accounting and I suspect I wasn't alone is you did what was asked of you and if it was tough difficult inconvenient hard you were just expected to put your head down and get it done I think the new younger generations in the workplace are much more into um, the self actualizing is this good for me does this fit with my objectives and that's going to change how we need to manage them because the things that we talked about, autonomy, relatedness, mastery, and purpose, really run across generation, I think there's an opportunity across generation to have conversations that mute the differences in um, generational expectations in the workplace. And so I think there's an opportunity there that we're not yet realizing. Is rather than talk about, well, you know, you're a 25 something and you need immediate gratification all the time. I don't have time to, you know, as a, as a boomer, to attend to your need for attention. Is if we talked about what's purposeful, what's, what matters to you, I could give you attention as a millennial from a boomer that would be much more appropriate. Thank you, Jocelyn. The, the whole concept of happiness for a project manager seems like a really uh, interesting topic. In fact, I would suggest that project management is one of the most stressful jobs I can even think of. So why would anybody want to be a project manager? Can you reflect on maybe some of the motivators that you've run across and uh, uh, what, what are some of the things driving people in this profession? I, I'm, I'm not sure I have the answer to that, but I suspect this group has the answer to that. So let's, let's do Quaker meeting style. Why, why are you in project management? Just stand out, shout it out, I'll repeat it. Why, why project management? Change lives. Huh? Change lives. Change lives? In what way, I'm curious. Uh, by providing means for them to be more successful in whatever they do. Okay, so change lives, enable others. Yes, ma'am. Hey, Susan. Incredibly, like, brilliant technical stuff. Complex things. Complex things, so self-fulfilling, yeah. What other reasons are you all in project management? Good paycheck is one of the things, but it's a hard way to earn it. Why else project management? Yes, sir. Solving problems. Yeah, and that taps into that mastery idea. We want to get better all the time, and one of the ways to really test your mettle is to have a really intractable problem that you figure out. What else? Why else in project management? Yes, sir. I, I didn't quite catch that. John, can you repeat that? Oh, sir. Any project needs a project manager. Without ah. a project manager, there is no uh, so the quality. possibility of continuous lifetime imp imp employment, is that, <laughs> let's be realistic. Why else? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, so one of the things we know from motivation theory is that what, what they call task diversity is motivating. You know, if you, if you ask me to come to work and make, you know, eggs over easy in the kitchen, you know, eight hours a day, 40 hours a week, it's not motivating. 
Um, if I were a short order cook, I could still be doing eggs over easy, but it would be much more interesting because there's more diversity. And so you're talking about it on a much bigger scale. Why else? David, why, why are you? You raised the question, why project management? Well, one thing led to another in my career, and pretty soon I was, uh, you know, at a higher level and doing uh, bigger projects, and uh, and then I got out of it. So it's pretty stressful. <laughs> Which is where I would suggest that that and and let me just make this the last comment because David's raising a very important point. One of the things that's really important, I encourage the students I have in the managing teams class and in the leadership class. Um, is it's really important that you do what's important to you, and that's going to fluctuate and, and shift over time. And so having the perception and making the time to reflect about what do you want to do and how are you going to make a difference, what difference is it important for you to make, is take a few minutes every year and have that internal dialogue with yourself and make choices. Uh, if you want to stay in project management, great. If you want to expand in project management, great. If you want to run a marvelous online library and newsletter, all the better. If you choose to do anything, but make it intentional. Uh, because fundamentally, if we have people who are happy, who are satisfied with life, they're not going to be a depreciable asset. And if you're project managers, you don't want your people to be expendable or depreciating. Thanks very much. <laughs>